I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. I'm Hope Cohen. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Rethinking Development, and uh, I'm here to moderate our uh, panel discussion on planning to compete in the global marketplace. Uh, the emphasis of the Center for Rethinking Development has been on uh, planning and zoning and infrastructure of the physical city, and uh, obviously we just had the mayors who have very broad briefs and uh, ranged over quite a, a number of topics, and I'm sure we will t t uh, touch on things beyond the physical city because people live in the physical city, so the lives of people uh, do come up in other contexts as well. But our primary focus will be on the physical city and how we can uh, prepare our physical cities uh, to grow and compete in uh, a world of growing urbanization and great cities. Larry Moon mentioned this morning that this is the second Thinking Big conference. Um, the first one two years ago uh, was again, was featured Mayor Bloomberg uh, speaking. It was only about New York, as, as uh, Julia mentioned. And then we had a panel. And the panel was kicked off by Professor Kenneth Jackson. And um, I, I'm glad that uh, Mayor Bloomberg is out of the room, as I say, that uh, Professor Jackson stole the show that morning, I believe. And uh, so we had to ask him back. And uh, for the Columbia community, I guess Ken Jackson needs no introduction, probably for the wider New York community, not either. Uh, very eminent uh, historian of New York, the editor of the Encyclopedia of New York, and the World Almanac of New York, and the Farmer's Almanac of New York, and basically anything else. The, uh, the Midnight Guide of Cycle Tours for Columbia students around New York. Uh, Ken Jackson, uh, to give us some perspective of where we've come from. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful that in a conference and in a session which is focusing on the future of New York and London that we make just a few minutes available to think about the past and how the past uh, informs and in some ways directs the future. In 1800, London was the largest and most important city in the world. Paris and Tokyo would be in a slightly second tier, but beyond that, uh, London was clearly in a class by itself. New York was in 1800 a small, city at uh, really b below Chamber Street, you, m usually much below Chamber Street in Lower Manhattan, and not at the moment any more important than Philadelphia, and by many people's judgment, probably less important than Philadelphia. In 1900, London was again the largest and most important city in the world, the home of the British Empire, which span the globe. New York by then was the second largest city in the world, already probably the capital of capitalism and the center of finance and the great new nation on this side of the world. The other claimants for great city status, again Tokyo perhaps, Vienna and the age of Freud, Berlin, then perhaps the best planned city in the world. Um, in 1945, I remember I was lucky enough to speak on, the, be a lecturer on the Queen Mary II, the QM2, and uh, another much more important and famous person was P.D. James, who was the famous British mystery writer who was on the ship as well, and she and I were table mates. And she told me that the most thrilling moment in her life was at a moment in 1945, I think early May, when the Nazis surrendered and the lights of London came back on after six years of relative darkness. Think how wonderful it was that what those lights represented, that Britain had just emerged victorious in a great world war. London was at the very center of that conflict. Um, 
the future seemed bright. And yet if we look back on 1945 and what was about to happen, we see all these negative things in England. For example, in the late 1945, late 1940s, the British people were literally cold and hungry, even though they had won the war. And if we looked further north, further into the future, we would know that the British Empire would disintegrate, that British industry would lose its competitive edge, and that the city itself would, by the 1970s, be in a kind of relative, if not absolute, decline. Think of New York City in 1945. Also a happy place, in fact, we think of the war ending when the sailor kisses the nurse in Times Square. The troop ships come home, packed to the gills. The city is by far the biggest and most important in the United States. And the United States itself, itself is bestride the world like a colossus. But think if we had predicted then in 1945 what was going to happen. The growth in America would be south and west. The seeds of that laid in World War II. But we, we now know, we didn't know in 1945 how profound that would be. Those people who didn't move to California or Florida would move to the suburbs, the vast suburbanization of the post-World War II period to Levittown and New Jersey and half a hundred other places. The decline of industry. In 1945, New York was the leading industrial city in the world. Indeed, remained so for another 10 years. Those jobs, I'm pleased to know they're making bicycles in London, but we have lost, we had more than a million jobs in early 1950s, now it's down, Bob Yarrow could probably give you an exact number, but 150,000, 200,000, but essentially they've gone. First to the suburbs, then to the south, now to Indonesia and China. In 1945 and then into the 1950s, this was the busiest harbor and port in the world with tens of thousands of longshoremen and stevedores pumping up the New York economy. Gone in the future if we could have looked ahead. Not totally gone, but mostly gone. And then, of course, there was 9-11 and the predictions that New York City was really cooked now because who would want to live in a skyscraper or work in a skyscraper or go in down to a dark subway? So that would make it difficult for us to have predicted in 1945 and 1950 that at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of this century, London and New York would remain, if not the largest cities in the world, certainly the most important two cities in the world, with apologies to Tokyo and a few other places. Now the economic downturn threatens, in a way, both cities. Indeed, it threatens the whole world. So I just wanted to take my last couple of minutes to think, what was it? How do we explain the fact that these two old cities, at least in relative terms, instead of declining into insignificance worldwide after World War II, knowing all the trends we know now, instead had remained at the top of the heap and despite their travails are still at the top of the heap? What characteristics, what qualities do those cities have, aside from their transportation system or their economic structure, but just something that's basic. And I just wanted to just mention several that I think work in the background as we, as my fellow panelists, think about where we will go in the 21st century. One end, I hadn't thought of it, I must say, until this morning listening to Mayor Bloomberg when he said English that obviously we speak English in New York and London and that's an advantage over other cities. Not sure how far I'd push that because in Hong Kong and Shanghai, English is really becoming the world language and people speak it there as well. But let's do, let's, going forward, we feel pretty confident that London and New York will have that advantage. 
But I would think there's some others that are a little more intangible. One, and perhaps the most important, is that they promise opportunity. All cities promise opportunity. Why do people, after all, give up the sunlight and the blue sky and the quiet for the higher costs and rough and tumble cities? But wherever you're moving the world, they think it will be better. And London and New York, over the decades and the centuries, have attracted generations of young people not expecting cheap prices, not expecting ease, but expecting opportunity. And that's what London and New York have given us over the last centuries and will continue to do, based on freedom. Berlin was a great city in 1930s. Well, we could, well, could we say it was a great, great planned city? But under Hitler, would you say it was a great city if you don't have freedom? Can Singapore ever be a great world city if it's not, you're not free to spit or chew gum? What is the balance between freedom and order? And one would think that London and New York have found this balance. Because order is the other side of that. You have to be safe in your beds at night. There are places in this world, Sao Paulo, which one might think of as a great competitor. But Sao Paulo, a huge business there, is armoring automobiles. Because, I don't know, there was a recent weekend where there were 450-odd people killed in Sao Paulo. That's what New York does in a year. Um, but you have to have a degree of order. And over the century, as Lisa Keller outlined in a recent book called Triumph of Order, both New York and London gained that balance between freedom and order to make them move forward. Another essential item here is diversity. In the year 2000, 2001, they were together the most diverse places in the world. Miami has a larger percentage of foreign born, 60 percent, but Miami is much smaller. And obviously if you go to Sydney or Melbourne or Vancouver or Toronto or Los Angeles or Houston, we know there's diversity everywhere. But London had 2.2 million foreign-born persons in 2001, New York 2.9 million in 2000. Those numbers are enormous. And they even understate the case. I know in New York, as we all know, that the undercount of illegal immigrants is gigantic in this city, so they're not here. And also remember that those numbers about New York City do not include the suburbs. Mayor Bloomberg referred to 8.4 million people or 8.1. They're really 22 million people in New York. Uh, it's just that 13 or 14 million of them just live beyond this legal boundary right here, but they also watch the evening news and read the newspapers and are reading, listening to the traffic reports on the radio because they are just as affected as the people in the city. And finally, and maybe most important, is toleration. Toleration of all sorts. Toleration, obviously, of political dissent. Uh, <coughs> London has that tradition of Hyde Park and speaking, I think slightly better than ours, but still this is where the Communist Party was headquartered. This is where the NAACP gets started. This is where gay rights defines its beginning is in New York City. Religious toleration, which goes through, you, you don't really care what you believe. Um, and especially in our time, uh, all sorts of behavioral aspects. So that sexual orientation, whatever you want to do in life, tends to be tolerated. I think that London and New York in the 20th century brought those qualities together better than other cities in the world. And I think that as we move forward, and maybe as we think about our discussion later, and what will happen in the 21st century, my prediction is that at the end of this current century, London and New York will again be the most important cities in the world with the caveat that some city in Asia probably Shanghai, maybe Tokyo, maybe Taipei, maybe Seoul, maybe Hong Kong. We'll join them. 
but there the diversity is not hit in. Tokyo is perhaps 99% Japanese and Koreans are treated like a severely disadvantaged minority. And in the other cities mostly as well, they tend to be more homogenous. I think in order to have global leadership in the 21st century, we're going to need to follow the model of London and New York and accept people who want to come, who want to work, who want to try. After all, when we think about New York and we think about the Lower East Side and those immigrant ghettos, they didn't come thinking it was going to be cheap, they didn't think it was going to be easy, and it was not. But ultimately, the city gave them hope and opportunity, and that's what I think they will do in the 21st century as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, so I was uh, glad that Mayor Bloomberg had left the room when I said something about Ken. Now I'm glad that Mayor Johnson has left the room when I say something about Sir Simon Milton, our second speaker. He's the deputy mayor. He was originally uh, appointed as the deputy mayor for uh, pl planning and policy, but he's, he's now just deputy mayor. He's the deputy mayor and chief of staff, which means that actually he runs London. Um, and, uh, and he also is absolutely key to the development of, of this conference, and we're very uh, grateful to him. And I think that he can run London uh, behind the scenes uh, because he's obviously a ve very effective um, person behind the scenes, but because he's also a politician before he was an appointed uh, uh, high-level city official, he was an elected official. He was the, uh, elected to, to the council in uh, ruling Westminster for 20 years, and uh, headed it for the last eight, which was a record, and uh, was so highly regarded that he was then uh, chosen as the head of all the local councils all over the UK. Um, but uh, clearly his first love is, is policy and planning, since that was his first title uh, in, the, in the Greater London Authority. And uh, he's here to start us on the path to the discussion of the future by telling us a little bit about the London plan, which you heard uh, referred to uh, during Act One. Oh, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ivan. Good morning, everyone. Um, the, I can tell you the London contingent has been having a great time in New York. It's been fascinating, very enjoyable, and we are just struck by how hospitable and gracious everyone has been. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who's made us feel so welcome. Chatting before the session started to Amanda, it occurred to me that it might be helpful if I just take a moment to set out what the mayor's powers in London are with regard to planning, because they are different from New York. And actually, it's one of those rare instances where the mayor has more direct power over something in London than uh, seems to be the case here. Uh, the mayor has two key roles. One is to uh, publish uh, something that is called the London Plan. And this is the regional spatial strategy for all of London, uh, and it is a statutory document. And what that means is that it is law, and that the 33 London boroughs, who each have to prepare their own local development framework, those frameworks have to be in compliance with the London Plan, and if they are not, they can essentially be struck out and they do not have legal weight. So the London Plan is the overarching and extremely powerful document that sets out a range of policies from where things can be built, what type of uh, development is appropriate in different locations, uh, heights of buildings, density, design, uh, energy usage, contribution to climate change, to improving air quality, uh, where housing and the quality, what quality and what type of housing, but at a very macro level, and it is then for the boroughs to interpret those re reasonably general policies and to uh, apply them in their own localities, fitting their own local specific circumstances. And we'll hear in a moment from Rosemary McQueen, a former colleague of mine at Westminster, who is the official who oversees all of that process uh, in Westminster, which is at the heart of central London. The other major power that the mayor has is over planning applications. And what happens is that if you wish to make an application for development in London and it triggers over a certain size, or for one or two other policy tests, it being on the river, for example, 
uh, then that application has to be notified to the mayor. The mayor is allowed to comment and say whether or not the application complies with the London plan and what it would need to change in order to comply. It then goes back to the borough for decision, but then the mayor has a second chance to act, and he can actually direct the borough to refuse permission. In other words, he could veto a development even if the borough was in favor of it. And secondly, and this is a relatively new power which is only for the first time about to be exercised, he can, what uh, we say, call in an application. He can say to a borough, I'm going to take this application away from you and make myself the decision-making authority. And that would be where it looks like the borough was going to refuse an application that the mayor thought was of strategic importance to London and that he wants to look at himself in order to decide whether he wishes to approve it. We have just uh, notified of one um, development where we are seeking to take the powers of decision to the mayor himself. And I should say that these, this decision-making is personal. It is the mayor as an individual who says yes or no. It doesn't go to a committee or a parliament or an assembly. So it's quite a lot of power to reside in one individual. Having got that background out of the way, um, I just want to say where we are with the London plan. Uh, this is, as I've mentioned, a major document. It is a, because it, is a, it has a strong legal weight, it has quite a lengthy process in order to be approved so that all stakeholders get the opportunity to uh, comment, to challenge, to have their say, and it culminates actually in legal hearings <coughs> called an examination in public where the mayor has to justify the policies in the plan. I'm going to ask you to turn to the document that you found on your seats, and in particular to page 14, because I think this, um, these charts <clears throat> more or less uh, capture <clears throat> the overriding challenges that we are seeking to address in the new London plan and our draft for consultation, uh, which has taken a year to produce, will be published next month on the 12th of October. And you'll see with these two maps that London's population is going through a significant surge, uh, up from 7.6 to nearly 9 million people um, over the next 25 years. At the same time, employment will also grow, but you will see from the two maps that they grow in different places. The residential growth uh, is all over the city, employment growth is concentrated in the central areas, the central activity zone, and in Canary Wharf. And what that will mean is that obviously more and more Londoners will have to commute distances from their residence to their place of work, to where the jobs are going to be. So one of the key challenges in the London plan and its related document, the Mayor's Transport Strategy, which is also being published on the 12th of October, is to really marry uh, these two things and come up with a sensible uh, land use policies matched with transport investment planning so that we are able to have a city where people can move around, where people can get to jobs, and where businesses can be supplied with goods and deliveries. If you look at the uh, map on 15, page 15, you'll see very broadly where we think London will grow in a series of growth corridors which all, uh, not by coincidence or not surprisingly, uh, lead to uh, airports, which are uh, major points of uh, access for the city. Um, the biggest area for development is what's called the Thames Gateway out to the east. Um, and this is where we have an abundance of what we call brownfield land. And I suspect that term uh, isn't widely understood based on one of the previous questions to Mayor Bloomberg. But uh, brown brownfield land is former industrial land. It's used land, quite often contaminated land, but it's land that has already been built on. And we are looking, rather than building on what we call greenfield land, to reuse land that is there to be used. The east of London uh, and the Thames Gateway was essentially the port. London, as we've heard from Ken, had, was a major port uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But the advent of containerization meant uh, that ships no longer had to sail all the way into London. And the ports died. But they left behind them empty land. 
all of London's manufacturing industry, which is also, as in New York, declined substantially over the last uh, decades, was all in East London. So we have miles and miles and miles of abandoned, of derelict, in some cases contaminated land because some of the manufacturing processes, chemical industries, uh, other types of industries really have left a legacy. And that is really the opportunity as well as the challenge for London is how do you bring that land back into use? What kind of de development can you attract there? Uh, what are the transport links you need to put in to make that land really uh, come back into use? It's also the area where we have decided to site the 2012 Olympic Games in the hope that that will be the catalyst uh, not just for the Olympic Park and the land immediately around uh, the Games, but will trigger development all the way down the Lower Lee Valley uh, and out uh, into the east of London. The key challenge we face in making these London, this London plan work is, of course, going to be putting in adequate transportation links that will get people to work where we already have a severely congested and crowded mass transit system. Now again, one of the areas where the Mayor of London has more direct power than the Mayor of New York is that he is the boss of the mass transit system in London. He sets the fares, he agrees the budgets, he plans the routes, he employs the staff. So significant uh, control. And if you look at the map on page 16, this gives you a very uh, quick look at where we see some of our major problems of crowding occurring and congestion that need to be addressed as well as uh, areas where we are looking to regenerate. There's a lot of investment planned, and I know there's a session on this tomorrow, so I won't go into that, but the maps on page 17 and 18 uh, give you some idea of some of the new lines, uh, the new rail infrastructure, the upgraded capacity uh, that is going to happen to allow us to meet those challenges. <clears throat> the other key challenge that we are addressing in the London plan is climate change. Um, I'm very happy to go into that in more detail and questions but it's really looking at new development and what is the contribution that new development can make to both reducing energy but also adapting to climate change in the years ahead. But as you heard from Mayor Johnson earlier, we also have a lot of programs uh, to deal with the existing buildings and retrofitting to meet uh, the Mayor's target of a 60% reduction in CO2 uh, by uh, 2025. Um, the plan goes public in a few weeks' time. There'll then be many months of consultation culminating in these legal hearings uh, next summer. And all being well, uh, it will then be finally adopted and have full legal weight at the end of 2011, only three years after the mayor was elected. But that's the way we do things in London. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so our next speaker, Amanda Burton, who's the um, head of city planning, the director of the uh, Department of City Planning and the chair of the City Planning Commission, does not have the advantage of a London plan. She has to do it without one. And um, the, the past eight years of the Bloomberg administration and the Burton administration have been actually a, an amazing achievement of uh, re zoning and thus reallocating and redefining uh, the landmass of New York City without benefit of that kind of uh, strong central con control that, uh, that Sir Simon was just describing in London. Um, so uh, I'm going to again hark back to the first thinking big. We had Amanda uh, talk then about was it 16% of the land mass had been, uh, of New York had been rezoned uh, up, to, up to that point? Up to that point? Okay, 20% up to that 20 point. 20 now. 20 now. 16 then, another 4% in the last two years then of the land mass of New York uh, without the advantage of, the London, uh, of something like the London Plan, but with, uh, for those of us in New York, uh, knowing the extensive public processes that are required for, uh, for doing uh, land use planning uh, here in New York, uh, and now, here we are two years uh, later, 4% of the landmass later, having Amanda back to talk to us about what comes next. Thank you. Th thank you, Hope. And I want to 
welcome our colleagues from uh, London and to thank the Manhattan Institute for gathering us here together and for an exhilarating opening uh, session. Clearly, our cities are so much alike that collaboration can only foster uh, new ideas, new innovations, and uh, uh, make these two great cities, the biggest and the best, uh, the best of partners. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, what we have done and what we um, are looking forward to doing uh, in the future. I believe that New York and London's greatest opportunity, at least one of them, is our population growth. A marked increase in population has brought our city to an all-time high of 8.4 million, as you heard from the mayor. And we, like London, are planning to grow to 9.1 million New Yorkers by 2030. Both cities have the density and comprehensive public transport system to make them uniquely sustainable locations to do business. Our unique challenge is to plan strategically for a city that is actually built out to its edges while we are adding population. What we have done is literally to reshape our land use mass by rezoning for increased density at transit-rich locations while limiting development in auto-dependent areas. We now have rezoned, as Hope said, roughly one-fifth of the city in this manner, or 8,000 blocks, setting a strong blueprint for a sustainable future. Also important has been the development of a mixed-use business districts in each borough. This five-borough economic development strategy will stimulate private investment citywide and keep jobs in New York City. Rather than just rezoning, we have also created large-scale urban design master plans as a key component in spearheading as-of-right development. From Manhattan's far west side to downtown Brooklyn to Jamaica and Queens to 125th Street, in Harlem, and now the famous Coney Island. Each of these initiatives integrates major commercial components with mixed use, mix, with mixed income housing. The next economic cycle will allow the completion of these long-term projects that have already received, appro received approval from the City Council. In all of these efforts, we fully recognize that the real bedrock of the city is the strong character of each of our neighborhoods, the vibrancy of our street life, and the quality of our public open spaces. In fact, our primary goal in these last seven years has been to create great places. For that reason, we have raised the bar for architectural excellence in public and private development demonstrating that good design is good economic development and is essential to the long-term health and sustainability of our city. The High Line is a perfect example of how great design can be a powerful catalyst for private investment. The transformation of this abandoned industrial artifact into one of the most unusual and exhilarating parks in the world has already triggered over 33 new development projects. And, quite amazingly, the most distinguished architects from around the world are clamoring to build there. It is this kind of innovation that keeps the city young, helping it attract new talent and creative thinkers. This commitment to quality of life is direct, directly linked to our sustainability agenda. We have already instituted regulations such as the greening of all commercial parking lots, requiring the landscaping of front yards, mandating that all new developments plant street trees, and requiring the provision of secure indoor bicycle parking. These measures will make a big difference at the scale of a city as large and as dense as ours. The next frontier for city planning in reducing the city's carbon footprint will be to promote energy and location-efficient development. We must encourage high-performance buildings to conserve and generate power and heat, including solar, wind, geothermal, cogeneration, and more. On a broader scale, there must be a 
unified vision for an integrated transportation, development, and environmental policy. We must divide, devise innovations for coping with congestion and greenhouse gas emissions across transportation, land use, economic development, and energy policies. This is about creating a city where all neighborhoods are walkable, healthy, energy efficient, bike friendly, and affordable. We are approaching this new challenge with the confidence that sustainability and good design, good urban design, are mutually beneficial and that New York City can continue to be as much of a leader in sustainable planning as it is in design, culture, higher education, and so many other areas that has always made New York City the global city of opportunity. Thank you so much. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.